Hey, everybody, and welcome to the live stream. I am Father Roderick, and so glad you can join me. I'm streaming on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitch right now. So glad you can join me for my uh, Christmas episode of The Break, which is my weekly podcast that you can find wherever you find your podcast by searching for Father Roderick uh, or The Break with Father Roderick. Um, so we're going to talk about Christmassy things. I'm going to give you my top 10 of favorite geeky Christmas movies. And I would love to hear your suggestions as well. I'm sure that everyone has uh, his or her own favorite Christmas movies. I really enjoy um, being able to 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 uh, podcast here from my little hobbit corner with the fireplace in the background. The only thing lacking are the the Christmas stockings. We we don't have those in the Netherlands, and I was googling online if I could find them somewhere, um, but I don't think they the, the the stores sell them. I don't think there's a there's a market for it. So maybe I'll instead uh, do like a little Christmas decoration here in the background, um, but. In the Netherlands, at least here, we we tend to um, – well, that's not entirely true. I was going to say that we tend to wait for Christmas until it is Christmas. Um, but that's only true when it comes to wishing one another Merry Christmas. We would do that after Christmas, uh, Christmas Eve, uh, whereas in other parts of the world – they started doing that right after Thanksgiving or in the, the whole entire month of, uh, of December. Um, but a lot of people already have their Christmas decorations up. Uh, I'm just a little bit late. I haven't really done anything to uh, decorate the house other than just I like the cozy atmosphere with the fire and the lights. And this is really my favorite time of year to be inside. Um, so uh, we're going to we're going to have a great time recording this podcast. I'm going to put on my my headphones um, and that's the only thing. Oh, wait. <laughs> I have to I have to do a little bit of rewiring here. Just go here and then how do I do this? Hold on. There we go. <laughs> you won't be able to tell from the image, but it's actually quite cramped in here. It's a, it's a very, very small desk that I'm on. So I'm constantly like juggling things around so I can, uh, <laughs> everything works. Hey, Merry Christmas, Deborah. Hey, Sandy. Hey, Carla. Hey, Pedro. Hey, Palomides. All welcome here in the chat. Um, I'll wait a few more minutes because I think that uh, people start to see the links now. Um, I've also posted this on Mastodon. I'm getting um, gradually more followers uh, on Mastodon. Um, but more importantly, I'm finding more people to follow over there because it's very much a platform for engagement. Um, and there's no algorithm, which means that if someone is following me, they will see my updates, which is definitely not the case with all the other platforms out there. Um, so, yeah. Maybe I'll talk a bit about that in the uh, in the new sex section of the of the show. Uh, hey, James! Um, first time listening live. Oh, wow, that's cool. All right, well, glad to see you here live. Um, and Graciela is there too. Flying car is there. Flying in with this car. <laughs> Sandy hasn't decorated either. So, uh, yeah, we were talking um, just when I started the. Um, the stream about uh, Christmas decorations and uh, I haven't put anything up yet. I wanted to do something here in the background, but um, uh, I, I figured I could do Christmas stockings, but I, I just can't find them here in the Netherlands. It's not a tradition here. We, we have sim something similar for, uh, for St. Nicholas where the children will put their shoes in front of the chimney uh, because of course, just like uh, Santa Claus, uh, St. Nicholas also uses the chimney uh, although he doesn't go down the chimney himself, he uses his personnel for that. <laughs> but it's the same idea. Although we have shoes and not stockings. Um, but hopefully um, I can see, I, we still have a few more days before it's Christmas time. So um, I'm sure that I'll, I'll 
be able to decorate the house a little bit more. Um, there's one last thing I need to do because I always say hi to my patrons. So I just do a last check to see if we've got any new patrons or not. Uh, let's see. Patron, patron. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, we have, we have Allison. Um, okay, and these are just um, messages on Patreon. And all righty. Very well. Okay, well, I think I'm good to go. Uh, Carla also hasn't decorated. I, I, I feel less guilty now. Thank you so much. <laughs> we're, we're, uh, we're running late. It's, um, yeah, it's still a bit weird to think that it's Saturday evening is Christmas Eve. Yeah. It's crazy how, how quickly this year has gone by. Anyway, let's, let's save all that for the show. I'm just going to turn off my phone in case anyone tries to disturb my uh, my recording session here, and uh, let's let's go. Hey everybody, and welcome to the Christmas episode of the Break. I am Father Roderick, and I wish you a Merry Christmas. You may be listening to this a few days before Christmas or on Christmas Day itself. I hope not. I hope you have better things to do, or maybe right after Christmas. But uh, my best wishes for the season. And also, this Christmas episode is brought to you thanks to my patrons, this wonderful community of people that support me with their monthly micro donations. Is that something you can do or want to do if you want to join me in my mission to reach out to people who may never step in a church or may never encounter a priest? Geeks like you and me. I try to reach them, and uh, and that works really well, but I need your support to be able to do that also in 2023. If you join the patrons... Um, and you get access to the Discord server, and there are some extra perks. There's an extra podcast that I record for my patrons. So lots of uh, lots of reasons to to join. And if you're not able to join, that's fine. Also, I'm already so glad that you're part of the listeners community. So uh, a big thank you at the end of this year to all my patrons who have supported me throughout this year. Merry Christmas to them as well. And um, I also want to do a shout out to Samuel, who has upped his uh, monthly donation. And maybe some of you will also do that before the end of the year. Um, and if you're in the Netherlands, um, you may also want to take a look at the, at the website, fatherroderick.com, because your uh, donations, your direct donations are tax deduct deductible because um, Tridio, the foundation that... Um, uh, that enables me to do this work is a nonprofit uh, organization with tax advantages. If uh, if that's something you're interested in, do you know what's going on? This is what's happening in your world. They said Catholics rule. We got Boston, South America, the good part of Ireland, and we're making serious inroads in Mozambique, baby. You've taken your first step into a larger world. So normally around this time of the year, you will notice that a lot of your favorite podcasters go on, let's say, on holiday mode. Uh, so you get all these kind of pre-recorded episodes, and it's uh, usually, especially after Christmas, it gets into that um, either you won't see any updates at all, or it's a compilation of best off stuff. Um, I always miss my podcasters uh, because... In, in in the week after Christmas and uh, the first week of January, um, I tend to have much more time to listen. And then everyone is on vacation. And I don't blame them. I totally understand. And I am also going to take a, a break or winter break. But I also do want to be there every week for you. This is something I've been doing every single week of this year. 52 weeks well the next week is still to come uh, but i've been there for you every single week i didn't skip a single episode of the break or the walk um because i that's what i would want to listen to so hopefully you will continue to listen and enjoy uh the winter episodes as well um and uh this is actually a time where there's so much going on in the world that 
I, I just want to talk about what's happening. If you just look at the situation in, in, uh, on, online and with all the big changes and things that are happening around the social media platforms and the uh, artificial intelligence, and there's so many, it, it looks as everything is in an acceleration and we're on the verge of something new. And it's very hard to determine what exactly that will be. But it's so appropriate around this Christmas time where we celebrate the new life or the you could say that the new turning of the page in history, that the, the birth of Christ is such a pivotal moment in, in mankind's history that um, it's, it's almost fitting that around this time of the year, so much is changing right now. Um, I don't know if you've been following the news with everything that's happening on Twitter and then the emergence of, well, not the emergence, but the, the growth of uh, alternative platforms like Mastodon um, and, and, and Post and Hive. And there are so many uh, new, all of a sudden new groupings of people are flocking to different parts of the of the internet um and there are also a lot of communities that are that are changing look at the way instagram has been changing this past year i don't know if it's for the better or for the worse <laughs> but but there's definitely a lot going on right now personally at this in in the, in in this phase you could say of the development of the internet i'm always looking for you know what's 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 new what is what is improving the, the creativity? I tend to, you know me, I don't focus that much on a negativity and on all the complaining and all the, you know, there's so much out there uh, that I don't feel the need to add to that pile of, um, of, of uh, <laughs> frustration and anger. Um, but there is so much to be happy with. Um, for instance, just the, the last two weeks, I've been, as you know, I've, I've, uh, um, started an account on, on Mastodon and I'm exploring that space and uh, people are, are flocking to Mastodon in millions. Like I think from the moment that uh, the changes started to occur at Twitter up until now, so in the last two months, you could say, um, more than two and a half million people have flocked to Mastodon. And, and so I've been searching for keywords and I discover so many cool people, especially artists. There's so many great artists there, and um, and it's it's pretty easy to find geeks like me, like fellow Star Wars fans. Um, to all these niches are starting to flourish there, and for me, the what I'm focusing upon the most is interacting. So not just posting. Like, oh, here is a link to my podcast. I do. I continue to do that because that's what I was using my my other social media platforms for as well, just to let people know that I'm I'm making content for them. Um, but I think th these past few weeks, I've rediscovered the value of of just being social and to interact and to give feedback and and not overthinking it, which is something that uh, really plagues me as a content creator is always overthinking instead of just sharing. I was like, yeah, but what would be the best, the best content to post on this platform? And what should I do on TikTok? And I meticulously um, kind of fabricate everything for a specific target audience. Um, and I've decided, you know what? I'm going to stop doing that. I'm just going to share what I'm passionate about. That I, what, that's what I've been doing on this podcast for for 15 years. And I know that that's why you listen. It's it's this because it's it's there's just so much, and it is um, is very personal, um, and it's not very curated because well. Usually when I when I do a podcast, there is just so much I want to talk about, and I want to bring that same kind of vibe that personal social interaction to to the platforms that I'm active on so um, hopefully um, I'll be able to uh, to also engage with people and they engage with me um, and for that's exactly what I'm currently experiencing so I'm having so many great conversations with people and and I just discover how how amazing the internet is and how amazing people are and how how they continue to surprise me day by day, day after day. And, and this, this for me has been the year of discoveries. Speaking of which, let's talk about, about my big discoveries this year when it comes to movies and TV <laughs> shows. like movies. They're predictable. Like the guy gets the girl and that kid sees dead people and Darth Vader is Luke's father. Not liking movies is like not liking puppies. 
they're fine. I just get bored and never make it to the end. You know, you need a movie education. You need a movication. I'm going to give it to you. So there are a couple of, of movies that I really enjoyed this year and that 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 were discoveries that I would like to share with you. And then after that, after I give you my best movies of, of this past year, um, I want to share with you my top 10 of favorite geeky Christmas movies. But let's start with what were my best movies of the year? I was, I was going through, um, a list of all the popular movies. I've been, uh, uh logging everything I watched on uh, an app, called TV Time, uh, which is really cool. It helps you to stay, um, to keep track of, of all the television series. And I noticed while I was um, adding to the app that I started so many television series and stopped watching after one or two episodes. So there's there, there are so many series that I still need to finish. Um, but... Uh, I'll talk about a bit more about those uh, favorite television sh series next week in the in my um, end of the year uh, podcast episode. Um, the other thing that I noticed is that I didn't see that many movies, and I think it's linked to two. It's it's for two reasons. The first is that in the first months of this past year, right after right before Christmas, we went into a very strict lockdown in the Netherlands. And it was devastating because we couldn't celebrate Christmas in, in church. Um, I, I remember helping here the parish here to stream Christmas on Christmas Eve, which wasn't the same. And then I think on Christmas Day, we could only admit a, a, a handful of people in the church. Um, and so all the movie theaters also were, were closed. And that lasted for a couple of months. And then um, I think the first movie I saw since the beginning of COVID was June. <laughs> which of course was already uh, like one of the major movie releases of the year. Um, and then after a while, I, uh, I, we started hearing that a lot of uh, studios were postponing their movie releases. And so a lot of the movies that were scheduled for 2022 have been rescheduled for 2023. And so at one point I was weighing um, the the benefits of, of staying subscribed to my local movie theater. I had this uh, flat fee subscription, which, which was still pretty expensive. I think it's like 26, 27 euros per month. That's a lot of money. Um, and I just didn't go to the movies that often. Uh, definitely not made my money back. And so I decided to stop that subscription and instead subscribe, continue to subscribe to a number of online uh, streaming platforms, which I think was the right thing to do because I definitely got a lot out of all those subscriptions. Um, and, but it did it did put a break on my movie uh, uh, consumption uh, this year. So most of the movies that I did watch, I didn't see them in theaters. I saw them online. So the exception being, of course, June, uh, which I think was probably with Avatar, The Way of the Water, uh, uh, the movie to go see in a theater on a big screen. Um, the, the just the seeing this on a in a in a in a I th I I saw it in one of the biggest uh, on on one of the biggest screens of my local theater, um, and it blew me away. It's not IMAX, but close close to IMAX. And June definitely benefited from the like the super Dolby whatever surround thing they do in the in the movie theaters there's no way I could uh, replicate that in my in my living room uh, I haven't seen the way of the water yet but I'm hearing from everyone who has already seen it that that is that movie makes it so worthwhile to go watch it in a, preferably in, in an IMAX theater but if not on the biggest screen possible go for the 3d version um, and 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 it's just a spectacle. It may not be the best story, um, but it visually it's it's uh, apparently unbelievable. I can't wait to see it. Um, before I go watch it, I will rewatch the original Avatar movie because apparently the the second movie makes a lot of references to the first movie. But it's been so long, I I can barely recall what that movie was about. So um, yeah, hopefully. I could. I think I might even have the 3D version of Avatar of the first movie, and I still have one TV 
I have a, a couple of old TVs that I use as monitors for my gaming console and for my computer. But I have this one TV that still has the passive 3D option. Um, it was an LG at the time. Uh, I don't think they make them anymore. And I can use my old P PlayStation 3 as a 3D uh, Blu-ray player. So I'm going to hook that up and I'm going to sit and watch that 3D movie on my old, I mean, it. so it's sometimes, I usually get rid of my old equipment, but I'm so glad I didn't get rid of my old PlayStation 3, nor uh, did I did I uh, throw away that, that old 3D TV because, uh, yeah, Avatar just is meant to be seen in 3D. But, so Dune for me was the absolute highlight uh, in theaters. What a great movie. And I'm so glad that very soon after um, they got the green light for the, for the sequel, which is currently in production. And, uh, and here's hoping that, that um, those two movies will revive interest for the whole Dune franchise, which of course is much, much bigger than, than just the first story. Um, and, and I'm secretly hoping that one of the big platforms will go for a television series. Um, they, they could use all the material that has been written afterwards. Um, and I don't think it would definitely, it, it would probably not work as well in theaters anymore because people get a little bit tired of, <laughs> Dune is a, is a huge investment of your time and it's not as visually compelling as for instance, uh, Avatar, which is super colorful and it's super vibrant and lots of different environments. Dune is all about, you know, it's, it's just sand. <laughs> not everybody wants to, to look at sand dunes and sand worms uh, for movie after movie, but I think this could probably work really well as a television show. Here's hoping. Um, then another movie uh, that really surprised me, and I did not expect to like it as much as I did, was The Batman. Um, as you know, I I like my superhero movies. I'm very critical when it comes to DC. Um, and of course, uh, uh, last week we, we talked about uh, the, the, the reboot that James Gunn is preparing for the whole DC universe and how um, uh, Cavill, Henry Cavill, Cavill is out as Superman. Um, he appeared in the post credit scene in, in Black Adam. Um, and, and it added nothing to the movie. I was so disappointed uh, because people were like, oh, but there's this, you know, Henry Cavill is back as Superman. So I expected something that would be a bit more than just, hey, I'm Superman. Bye. End of story. I'm not spoiling anything, but it's just what a waste of of his last appearance. Anyway, um, so and and I I wasn't a big fan. Well, I did like I I liked what they did with the 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 uh, Christopher Nolan's Batman Batman, uh, but I wasn't a fan of of the how dark it went. Um, and so I was reading the reviews for the Batman. And uh, they all said the same. It's even more, more broody. Is that a word? <laughs> it's, it's dark. It's moody, probably. Moody and broody. <laughs> and so, and it was super long, according to all the reviewers. So I watched it on HBO Max. And it's my favorite Batman movie. Absolutely the best of all the Batman movies that I've seen. Um, I loved what they did with all the symbolism. It's a very subtle movie. Um, just, just the whole Batman, Batman's arc and, and how he learns about who he is and who he wants to be. It's a vocational story. It's a story about redemption. It's a Moses story. Uh, I did a couple of videos on YouTube and on TikTok explaining the biblical symbolism in this movie. And, and, and it's all over the place. Um, I really enjoyed it. So, um, yeah, the Batman definitely in my top three of favorite movies. And then another movie um, that I also did not expect to love as much as I did was um, uh, was going straight to to streaming. Um, and it was uh, turning red um, on, on Disney Plus. And I I so love that movie because I recognize so much of the 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 topics that were central to the story it's it's about generational trauma it's about a mother and her daughter and even a, a grandmother and and her daughter and um it's about 
not being accepted in school, uh, bullies, trying to be part of, 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 of the, the hip people and then, of course, not succeeding and, and, and ultimately coming to terms with who you, who you want to be and who you are and that's good enough. And there was so much, so much in that movie that moved me and, and that I, and that's rare. It's an animated movie. Um, but I, I guess it doesn't matter in what form you tell a good story. If it's a good story, it, it works. Speaking of which, speaking of animation and how much it can move you, maybe, and I can't really say for sure, next week I'll be able to tell you what I really think, but maybe the movie that I love the most already, even though I've only seen half of the movie so far, is Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. What a masterpiece. Unbelievably well done. It's stop motion uh, animation. Um, they've been working for years on this movie. And it came out in the same year that Disney also brought us their live action version of Pinocchio. I've been, I've been a fan of Pinocchio ever since I saw it as a child as an animated movie, the Disney but Pinocchio, of course. Um, I love that movie, even though it was scarier than I than I actually remembered it to be. Um, I guess I just kind of forgot about about how how creepy it sometimes was, um, and 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 so I had high hopes for the for the real life action version of Disney, and I did not like it at all. It was no, it it didn't work for me. It was on the one hand, it was too much a copy of what they of the animated movie, and then. And then it, it did these weird things where they they made strange creative choices that I didn't think worked really well. And so, no, that was a big disappointment. And so with a bit of apprehension, I, um, I, was, I watched the, the, the new... Uh, um, oh, wait a minute. I have to do a little bit of moderation here. Sorry about that um, in the chat. So... Um, I, I I didn't know what to expect with this Pinocchio movie. And what I certainly didn't expect was that it is also a musical and there are wonderful songs in there. And it's and it and, and they the songs are are quirky and just as original as the animation is and, and the way they tell the story. I loved how they give a backstory to Geppetto and why he creates Pinocchio. And it's so moving and so Wow, unbelievable. I didn't know that there was so much potential in this story that has remained untapped for, for decades, if not a century, because it's a very old story, as you know. Um, and apparently, I couldn't finish it last, last evening, but apparently towards the end, it, it gets even better and it gets uh, really uh, emotional. So I'm, I'm super impressed and I can't wait to hear what you think of it as well. Now, the last question I have for you is, um, what is your favorite movie of the year? Um, because I, I, I bet you some of you have seen way more movies than I have. Uh, what is your absolute favorite? Let me know in the comments uh, or on Discord if you're um, a patron. Because um, I can still use some suggestions for my Christmas break. Uh, I, I'm sure that there are a lots, lots of movies that are worth my time. So from that, let's go over to, of course, the topic of the of this week's podcast, and that is the top ten of most geeky, most enjoyable Christmas movies. I'm going to go through these movies quite fast because I'm sure that you have seen them all, and um, I, and I'm just curious to hear what you think of my list. So um, here we go. It's in no particular order. Uh, of course, the first one that came to mind is Die Hard. Who doesn't love to rewatch Die Hard uh, on, on their Christmas break? Um, it takes place, of course, during Christmas. There's a lot of debate among geeks whether this counts as a Christmas movie. I would say there's one element in there that I think is a parallel to the gospel and, and especially the story of the nativity. And that is what happens at the nativity. It's this unlikely hero that is born at, on Christmas Eve. It's this child. He has no power. He doesn't wear any shoes. 
He's he's born naked in this world. He has no weapons. Um, he just is there because the story requires it. There is so much darkness in the world. The uh, mankind needed a redeemer, and there he was. And it's the same theme of the unlikely hero that is so central to Die Hard, and it's why we love it so much. The character of Bruce Willis is this cop who is not supposed to be able to tackle a situation like that. He also wears no shoes. He has no weapons. He acquires some later on in the process. Um, but uh, uh, he, he still manages to defeat this overpowering darkness against all odds. And if that is not a Christmas story, then I don't know it anymore. So next Christmas movie, uh, Gremlins. It's, the entire movie takes place around Christmas time. And it's all about this kind of Christmas gift, this cuddly, you know, strange creature that you should definitely not feed after midnight. And so, well, we, we all know how that, how that ends. Um, it's, it's a wonderful movie. Again, scarier than I remembered it. It is pretty gruesome. Like a lot of these movies from the 80s and the 90s, um, if you go back and watch The Goonies, for instance, you'll be shocked by the language in that movie and just how far they went in those years. And, and yet we all remember it as a very family-friendly movie. Same thing with Gremlins. Um, I don't know. Maybe you should watch it before you, you, you uh, show it to your, uh, to your eight-year-olds. <laughs> Another favorite of mine that I keep watching over and over again is Family Man with Nicolas Cage. It's the story of Scrooge, but in a, in a, different, in a different story. Uh, no, it's the same story, but in a different format, I should say. It's about this very, very rich, solitary millionaire, kind of an Elon Musk type of guy. And um, one day he wakes up in the alternate version of his life. What if he hadn't gone for his career, but instead he would have chosen to go for, for his family? And, um, and his life is totally different. And he, for the entire movie, he tries to get back to his old life. And then, well, there's a lesson to be learned. And it's, it's a great movie. Um, very, very charming. One of the best roles, I think, of, uh, of Nicolas Cage. Jingle All the Way, another favorite of mine. It is actually a very fun movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger playing a dad who needs to get this ultimate action figure toy for his kid. But so does every other parent. And there is this war going on about the last, the last... Uh, um, uh, I say that, not copy, but the, the, the last toy in, that is available in the store. And it's just this ongoing war that gets worse and worse and worse. And of course, in a, in, in a certain way, it's a criti criticism of our consumerist mentality for Christmas and how crazy people get. Uh, and they forget that Christmas is not about stuff and it's not about gifts. It is about... It's it's about family. It's about how God became our family, um, because in in Jesus we we got a brother, uh, and and we be, became all like brothers and sisters of one another. And and so uh, love how Jingle All the Way uh, manages to sneak in that Christmas message, even though it's just it, most of all it's a really really fun movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I think doing what he does best, and it's not fighting, but it's it's uh, it's his humor. I, he always has a knack for these, these dry one-liners that are so incredibly funny. Home Alone, of course, I have to... Actually, I was very late to the party when it comes to Home Alone because that movie became popular when I was in seminary and we didn't watch television. I never went to the movies except for one, one movie that I watched during those two years of, of early seminary in Belgium, and that was Back to the Future 2, which I've shared in one of the previous episodes of this podcast. But... Um, so I never saw Home Alone when it was at the top of its popularity. And it's only much, much later when, when I was able to catch it, I think, on Netflix. That's, that's just a few years ago that I saw Home Alone for the first time. And it was hilarious. It was so funny. And I totally understand why it's such a classic favorite for, for so many of you. Um. Batman Returns, uh, the second Batman movie um, that I've watched with uh, Danny DeVito playing 
uh, The Penguin. That is a very dark Christmas movie, but it's done in such a awesome way. The set building, this is all pre-digital effects. Um, so a lot was practical, a lot was miniatures. Um, it's, it's an amazing atmospheric movie, highly underrated, I, I would say. And it's a, it's a totally, if you've never seen these old Batman movies, it's worth checking them out because it's so, so different from, from the Batman that we currently know so well, you know, the Christopher Nolan Batman, the Snyderverse Batman. Um, and yet it worked. The, the quirkiness, the goofiness, it had a comic book feel to it. Um, Love, actually, it's a totally different genre. It's a, it's a romantic comedy. Some of it didn't age very well, but it was one of those first popular, very, very big box office success movies that was doing something that afterwards became super popular where they tell all these separate stories. And it's only towards the end of the movie that it all comes together and there are relationships. It's a very modern storytelling technique. At the time, it was like a bit disconcerting because like, what is this movie about? There's not one protagonist. You'd, of course, in their advertisements, on the posters, it was all Hugh Grant, who plays the UK prime minister. Um, but it's not a Hugh Grant movie. It's, it's, there are four or five different storylines that all intertwine towards the end. It's a very charming movie. Um, I think with a, with a moving Christmas message, and not all the stories end well. Um, yeah, I, I can't say anything else for fear of spoilers, but, um, Alan Rickman is also, uh, playing one of the characters in, uh, so <laughs> we all miss him still. Uh, but before he was Snape, he was, he had this wonderful role in Home Alone, uh, not in Home Alone, <laughs> in Love Actually, sorry. <laughs> And, and actually, his story was um, one of the most touching elements of, of uh, love, actually. Then, another register, another genre, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Of course, uh, lots, lots of Harry Potter movies have Christmas components, especially the, the early ones, because, of course, it tells the story of an entire year at school. And, well, the Christmas holiday is important for all the kids and uh, they do the holiday decorations. What I loved about the first movie is um, that they really dwell on it and they show how important Christmas is for Harry Potter, um, especially Christmas at Hogwarts because it's the first time in his life that he gets Christmas presents. And so um, Ron Weasley's mother has made him an, a very ugly sweater, an ugly pullover <laughs> with, with the, the letter H on it but he treasures it because it's the first time that he celebrates Christmas with a family that loves him. And then, of course, later on, he gets these, these myster this mysterious gift from, I don't think at the time he knows who, who gave him that. It's a, it's a you know, secret Santa, and it's this invisibility cloak. And, of course, later on, we discover it, it was Dumbledore who gifted that. And that it wasn't just a, a cool toy that made you invisible. But it was actually a very, very important um, element of the entire saga. Uh, again, no spoilers for those of you that haven't seen it yet or haven't read the books yet. But um, I just loved what they did with the Christmas sequences in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And of course, you've got the amazing John Williams music that is so Christmassy. Oh, boy. I, I sometimes just played that particular sequence of that movie for Christmas. And then a, a, an old favorite of mine, and it's mostly not just nostalgia, um, The Muppets Christmas Carol. I watched that when I was still in seminary, I think, or maybe even before that. And I loved it so much. Um, we also had a, a record, a, like a, how do you call that? Yeah, a record, like an old fashioned record uh, with, with um, John Denver and the Muppets. So, John Denver recorded an entire album with the Muppets, and we played that over and over and over again. This was way before we had a VCR to record these Muppet shows, and so we would watch every week. We watch a new episode of The Muppet Show. We love that so much. And, and so having a, a, an album was a way for us to 
to to put the Muppets on repeat because you would have all the voices singing along and it was just so funny and so magical. Um, yeah, I, I really cherish that um, that album um, because it it colored a lot of my Christmases over the years when I was young. And then my final question for you is what is your favorite Christmas movie? I could have gone on forever. There are hundreds of Christmas movies. Um, but I know that you have one movie that you will absolutely always watch at Christmas time. Could be a recent movie, could be an old one. Um, I'd love to hear your favorite movie. Again, give me some suggestions and I'll, I'll watch some of them. <laughs> Catholics rock! Here at The Peculiar Bunch, we always like to tell you everything you always wanted to know about Catholics, but you were afraid to ask. Catholics can be a peculiar bunch. No meat on Friday. No oh, meat? What do they eat? Light bulbs? And on today's episode, I want to uh, answer or try to answer or react to a very important question that I saw on Patreon, on my Patreon Discord. Man, you guys got more crazy rules than Blockbuster Video. Yeah, on our Discord server, uh, our patrons often have these very deep discussions about faith. And I love it so much because not everybody who is supporting me as a patron is Catholic or is even uh, from a Christian background. And so oftentimes you will get these questions that um, for cradle Catholics like me are like, wow, okay. So I've never asked that question or it's been a long time since someone asked me that question. Um, but it helps me to, to realize that for some people, even questions that I may have heard over and over again um, are um, sometimes very important to other people and, and can also, if, if, they are left unanswered can be stumble blocks for people to understand why why Christians believe what they believe and maybe maybe the hardest question and the question that is asked in every generation in every culture is why why do bad things happen to good people especially and that's a question that everybody asks because we are all confronted with evil and and the results of evil but also just mishap and 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 cruel fate it seems but that be, that question becomes even more pertinent and more difficult uh to face if you believe in god especially if you believe in a christian god who revealed himself as a loving father so if god is love if if love is the best definition for god and why does a loving God allow bad things to happen to good people? We, we kind of still could accept a world that is just broken and bad stuff happens to everyone. But if, if, if you have people that you love and that have lived a, an exemplary life, why do they get cancer? Why do they die of COVID? Uh, why are they losing uh, their faculties and, and, the question of there are multiple ways to answer this question. Um, none of them will actually satisfy you. I already know that because this question ultimately in its core doesn't have an answer. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't have something to say in when it comes to this question. The first, the first thing I would say is. Um, especially if you would ask that question for yourself, why do does all this bad stuff happen to me? That's kind of the selfish version. Although, you know, it's perfectly understandable if you sometimes ask yourself, well, why is this happening to me? What did I do wrong that this is happening to me? Well, another question you could ask yourself is, well, why wouldn't it happen to you? Why would it happen to someone else? You know, why would someone else get cancer and you wouldn't get cancer? I mean, it's a kind of heavy handed topic for, for a Christmas show, but, but bear with me. I'll get to Christmas in a minute, but, but, but that's a, that's a very good question. Why, why not me? Why, how am I better than anyone else? So that's, a, that's the first thing to remind yourself of, but then why do bad things happen to good people? 
um, being good and living a good life does not inoculate you against tragedy. We all know that. Even good people are still vulnerable people because we all are. It's part of our human condition in this life is that there is, there is a lot that we can do to change the world for the better. And I hope that we all do that. And that is our, that's why we are here on this planet, it is to make the world a better place. We are not here just for ourselves and just to enjoy life to the max and then, well, let other people just figure out their lives. No, we are here to contribute to this world and to make it better. At the same time, we are also part of a broken world. And the reason that our vocation is to make this world a better place is because this world is so broken. If this world wasn't broken, then God wouldn't need us to make it better. So isn't it interesting that in the core of our vocation to be a good person, and how do you how do you become a good person? It is if you're good for other people, right? The, 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 the other side of the medal is that this we are called to be good people because this world isn't always good. And so there are there are prisoners to free, there are sick people to heal or to comfort. There are poor people to clothe and to feed. There are situations where, where um, natural disasters are causing so much suffering. There are wars in this world, and we are called every time to do something about it. And even when you are confronted with someone, a good person that you love so much and who is experiencing something very bad, God hopes that you are not just going to complain about why is that bad stuff happening to that good person, but that you will, that you will be the good that happens to that person in that bad situation. Faith challenges us to reframe our, our biggest questions and, and these awful situations. And, and I know that that does not necessarily intellectually satisfy us if God is the ultimate good. And if he's all-powerful, what kind of God is he that he lets us experience, it, experience all this misery? So my only reply to that is... Um, that even Jesus, who we celebrate this Christmas, is born in the midst of darkness. We, we, we romanticize the Christmas nativity story, but Jesus was born in the midst of persecution in a country that was occupied by the Romans, where people were extorted, where the children were threatened by Herod, who wanted to kill all these firstborn Right after Jesus was born, his father, Joseph, had to take Mary and Jesus to Egypt because otherwise Jesus might have gotten killed as, as, as so many other babies were, were killed. And so the story of Christmas is God's answer to this big question, why is all this bad stuff happening to us? For centuries, the people of faith, the people of Israel, have been praying the same prayer. God, how long are you going to allow this to happen? How long? The, the Psalms, if you read the Psalms, they're full of these kind of prayers. Why does this happen to us? When can we finally await your deliverance, your answer to all this evil? But the answer that God gives is so different from what everybody expected. Everybody thought that God would answer by sending a Messiah who was powerful, who would use his political power, military power, to overthrow the occupant, uh, the Romans in this case. Uh, just as in the past, sometimes God would send kings, who would, like King David, who would make their people strong, who would rebuild Jerusalem, etc., etc. And instead, what does God do? He sends a baby, a child that can't even speak, that's God's answer. It's vulnerability in the midst of misery. So instead of 
telling us, let me fix this for you. God, first of all, wants to share in the experience of these bad things. If there, is, if there is, was one person who was good it, it, to the 10th degree, it was Jesus. There was no evil in him. And yet, the, from the moment he is born, he is in peril. And his, he and his parents suffer the consequences of evil and, and, and uh, the, the hunger for power at, and, and the, the, the dangers of persecution. And, and that lasts for most of his life up until the very last breath that he gives this, this earth on the cross. Um, Jesus suffers what we suffer. He experiences as the son of God what evil does and how much it hurts. Um, and it's a promise. It's also a promise that the darkness will never be stronger than the light because ultimately even death, the ultimate darkness, wasn't able to eradicate Jesus. Um, the ultimate answer to evil and to the destructive force of evil is not the silence on the cross where Jesus is asking God, where are you? Like that's that's ultimately, I think, behind this question of like, why does bad stuff happen to good people? It's ultimately, it's the same thing that Jesus cries out on the cross. Father, where are you? God, where are you when bad stuff happens? But God's reply, God's real definitive answer is on the morning of the resurrection where Jesus rises from the grave where life definitively wins uh, from death and destruction and darkness, where forgiveness um, becomes the mission of, uh, of, of uh, Christ's disciples. You know, go into the world, go forgive people their sins, bring them into this light and life of God, because that's our vocation. And that's ultimately also what we have to do in this situation. God is not, not, at least for now, not going to fix the world. But he is fixing us to do something about the darkness in the world. It's kind of the same reframing that you have in that famous speech by John F. Kennedy. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Ask not what God can do to fix this bad situation. Ask what you can do in God's name to help the people that are confronted with this evil. And trust that the current situation is not the definitive situation for eternity. There is going to be a reckoning <laughs> with evil definitively. It's already been vanquished. Um, you as a person can do so much more good than evil can do uh, can, can destroy things. Um, but that, that is still a promise that will ultimately reveal itself at the end of our history when Jesus returns and there will be no more evil and there will be no more suffering and there will be no more tears. And the beginning of this, of this, of the fulfillment of this promise is with Jesus who has ended so much suffering of the people that he met. Every time he meets someone who is in need and who is suffering, he helps that person. He heals them. He forgives them. He even raises them from the dead like uh, Lazarus. And he wants us to do the same in his footsteps. Um, that is what Christmas is about. It's the beginning of God's answer. And we are part of that answer. That's how I tend to look on this question and I know how hard it is when it becomes something close to home and when it's something you, someone you love or it's something that happens to you. But always remind yourself that God has given an answer to all this suffering by sending us Jesus who, be, who suffered like us and at the same time who promises us, have faith, I am going to deliver you from, from all this evil and from all this suffering. God will not remain silent for all eternity. Hope that helps. When did you become an expert in thermonuclear astrophysics? Last night. The packet. The extraction theory papers. Am I the only one who did the reading? 
I am still reading my last three books to uh, finish my, um, <laughs> my, my book reading challenge for this year. And in this episode, I want to um, share with you the five nonfiction books that have had the most impact on me this last year. And then next week, I will share with you the five uh, fictional books or, or, or how do you say novels that I read that I enjoyed the most this year. So what is my top five of most impactful books, nonfiction? The first one I read, I read uh, pretty recently written by Jeanette McCurdy, who used to be a childhood uh, television star. And she wrote a book now that she has grown up about her past and about the trauma that she suffered from uh, a mother who was extremely narcissistic and um, has played a very destructive role in her life on many different levels. The book is called I'm Glad My Mom Died. It's been a bestseller for a reason. Uh, one word of warning, there are some graphic depictions or descriptions of sexual uh, situations. Um, that may not be everybody's cup of tea, to put it mildly, but for the rest of the, uh, the book is, is, is super impressive and, and also very relatable. Um, I was very impressed by that book, and I keep thinking about it. Jenna, Jenny Lawson wrote uh, an, another book that uh, made a huge impact on my life. It's called Furiously Happy, a funny book about horrible things. Jenny Lawson um, is uh, someone who suffers from um, pretty severe episodes of depression, um, and it's not something that is solvable. She has to medicate, and uh, but what I loved about this book is that She's still in the midst of all the difficult and hardship moments in her life. She uses humor as a way to, to put things into perspective. And, and the book is furiously funny. It's hilarious. Um, and it also kind of gets the whole mental health issue out of the, uh, the taboo um, atmosphere that often surrounds it. Um, highly recommend it. Very, very funny. Then a, a book that has changed my the way in which I prepare my days, and I, I use the the what this book is about. I use it every single day. It's called the Bullet Journal Method, written by writer Carol. This uh, method, where you just use pen and paper to plan your day, to plan your month, to plan your year, has uh, changed everything in the way I approach my work. And it has helped me to put my work in perspective, to focus more on what is not on to-do lists, but on why I do the things on my to-do list and why I maybe shouldn't do things that are on my to-do list. Uh, that's the result of this method. I love how simple it is. Um, and I read the book and I was convinced that this was for me, but I only started to understand what the book was all about once I started to apply it and I started my bullet journal. It's on my desk um, every single morning. Um, and I don't think I can ever go back to not using a bullet journal. It doesn't replace the other journaling that I love to do where it's more like long form. And I write down how I feel or my thoughts or sometimes a, a dream that I had and my thoughts about that. But but the bullet journal, journal is, is really good for, you know, very simple planning and especially evaluating the things that you do and getting a realistic idea of what is possible to do in a day. Um, another book that um, had a massive impact on me uh, is written by Julie Smith. Um, she, her rise to fame was on TikTok where as a psychologist, she would explain very, very, practical psychological insights in a, in a super uh, funny and understandable way. Uh, she's a great educator. And so she wrote this book about mental health um, and about all the, uh, all the challenges that you may encounter when it comes to your mental health, um, but constantly uh, explaining with uh, um, the, the, you know, a, a good background of psychology why, what science can teach us, what psychology can teach us about how to approach these situations, and also offering a lot of 
very specific solutions. Um, and then so it, it, it has been a game changer for in many aspects of my life. And, um, and, and a book you can reread multiple times. So it's definitely a book to own. Um, uh, if you only know Julie Smith from TikTok, you may expect a book that is very lighthearted. Um, but it's not. It's actually a, a very, very thoroughly researched book. And so you see the, the professional also in this book. Um, so it's a good complementary uh, um, medium, I think, for Julie Smith. I highly recommend it. If you don't follow Julie Smith yet on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or YouTube, look her up. It's absolutely worth it. And then the last book that was um, very impactful for me was written by Adam M. Grant. And it's called Think Again. The Power of Knowing What You Don't Know. And the reason I mentioned this book, I, it's one of the first books that I read in, at the beginning of this year, is that it, uh, it challenged me to go beyond the bubble of my, uh, my current knowledge and to go beyond the bubble of things that I'm comfortable with and to go explore and to not be afraid to expand your horizon, even though, even though it may actually contradict stuff that you always believed was true or challenges you. Um, and the book, I think, makes a very good point of why that is so important and why it can help you to also um, uh, deepen your beliefs. So um, oftentimes when I was growing up, and, and when I was in seminary and also in, in my first years as a priest and as a podcasting priest, I had so many Catholic friends who told me, you shouldn't watch that movie. You shouldn't read those books. You shouldn't. Instead, you should only read uh, books by Catholic the theologians or saints or whatever. Um, and, and this book says the opposite. It says, sure, definitely go and, and deepen your faith and ask, but also seek deliberately seek people that challenge you, that don't agree with you, that may have totally opposite views. And don't be afraid of them. But instead, be thankful that those people are there to sharpen your mind and to sometimes maybe also give you different insights. It starts with listening to these people. And if you don't do that, if you do, this is why these social media bubbles are, are in fact not a blessing for us. And they may feel very comfortable. But I always encourage people to follow people, uh, to follow others on, on social media um, that are totally outside your bubble, maybe on the other end of the spectrum. But always try to look for people that, that actually really want to contribute something to society. And even if your walk of life is different from theirs, use their, their, their contributions um, First of all, as a, an exercise in empathy, why is that person making those choices that are so different from what I would choose to do? Um, also use them as people that, that create an itch. Like, I want to know more. This is why in my podcast, I always try to answer these questions from people that maybe have a hard time following me in, in my Catholic you know, walk of faith that, that may have gone through experiences that have turned them off of, of certain Christian beliefs. Um, critics are, are important. This is also why I, I'm always so irked when bishops uh, or, or fellow priests are very um, hostile towards the words the press and they, 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 they feel that 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 uh, journalists are not respectful enough, etc. I'm thinking, you know, you should thank them. We we need very critical journalists. If we wouldn't have had the 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 investigative journalism in Boston, like imagine how many victims of of abuse would have remained silent, and how much it was extremely difficult and continues. To, it was the first domino of a whole sequence of dominoes that is still falling up until this moment. Even today, there are still more and more revelations of abusers among the clergy, among the bishops, among the high-ranking religious people. And we need those journalists to, uh, to, come, to speak the truth 
even if it's an in inconvenient truth, even if it hurts to read it, because it helps us to become better people. It helps you to sharpen your mind and to maybe sometimes also change your ways. All right. So that was my top 10 of most influential books that I've read. Again, I welcome your uh, suggestions as well. What was your favorite book this year? Um, love to hear what you think and what you've read. We're approaching the end of the episode. And so I doing a quick jump into, I, I'm jumping quickly into the kitchen. Of course, Christmas time is a time where you, um, where we do a lot of cooking and a lot of eating. I'm not going to go over Christmas recipes because I never have them. <laughs> Usually Christmas time is when I don't eat very well because of all the, the liturgy, uh, all, the, all the Christmas celebrations that I have to do. So I don't have time to cook. Um, instead, I will give you a short recipe for something uh, that I often find in the back of my fridge, and that's carrots. I have always hated carrots. I there you go. There there it is. Uh, like carrots, we we as a child we were often forced to eat carrots, either raw or in a carrot salad, or even worse in a carrot uh, um, mash. You know, carrot mash with with potatoes um, because. My parents believe that it was healthy. And yeah, carrots are healthy. They're not good for your eyes and all that sort of. There's a lot of mythology around carrots. Um, so it's not it's not better than any other vegetable. But I just couldn't stand the taste of it. Carrots were kind of, especially when cooked, they became like this nauseating baby food-like sweet, mushy goo. Ugh. And then... Uncooked carrots also didn't really have much taste, and and they were they had an unpleasant feel to them. I don't like eating raw carrots. So what do you do when you still have carrots in your fridge? And you, and I, I I don't want to throw food away, especially not vegetables. But I I was looking for so the best solution for this that I found up until this moment was carrot soup. You could put anything in soup, and carrot soup is the least the least disgusting way of eating carrots. I, I hope I'm not scandalizing some of you carrot lovers out there, but <laughs> I'm just telling you what I, how I feel about carrots. But I have another solution for those carrots, and that's a Moroccan carrot salad. Inga ta taught me this. Um, it's um, So it's from the Moroccan uh, cuisine, and it... it it's actually surprisingly, surprisingly edible. So the way it works is you cut your carrots. You first, of course, you, you peel them. Um, you cut them into small pieces and you put them in a pan and you cook them until they are a little bit soft, not too soft. You don't want them to come mushy. Um, but very important, add salt to the water. It's just like pasta. If you cook it without salt, it doesn't have any taste. So salt is, imp is imperative there. Um, and also make sure that it still has a bit of a bite. Then um, make sure that it cools down. Put it under the, the cold water because you don't want those carrots to cook any longer. And then uh, once they are, uh, no, when they're still hot, that's a trick. You put them in a big bowl and you add olive oil, a pretty big dash of olive oil. And here it is, vinegar. Equal amount of vinegar to taste, of course, if you don't like the vinegary taste. but um, And then you have to add crushed cumin. So it's this powder that you, has, you also have uh, cumin seeds, but they you, yeah, the, the flavor only comes out if you crush them. So I just got, uh, I went to Little and I, they had um, like the curry, no, the um, cumin powder. So cumin powder and paprika powder. So crushed paprika powder it adds a lot of sweetness to the taste. And if, but again, try it out. Uh, maybe a little bit of extra salt, depending on how salt the water was in which you cooked it, the, the carrots. That's all. You mix it around. And when the carrots is still hot, um, it absorbs these flavors. And then you can let it cool down. And it's actually really good. 
as a salad. I wouldn't eat it <laughs> as a standalone dish, but it works really well in conjunction with other Moroccan dishes or maybe um, uh, fried potatoes or or uh, what's the word? I'm looking for the... Um, do, 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 do. Not rice. Well, what is that grain that you can cook? Um, oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Um, oh, it will come to me. Doesn't matter. You could, but you could use it as a side dish, and it's 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 quite nice. And now I'm thinking, you know what? This technique probably also works with other uh, herbs as well. Um, so I'm gonna try some combinations, and maybe, maybe. I will get to learn how to eat carrots. This is one of the reasons that, I, that I'm so glad that I'm a Christian and I don't believe in reincarnation. Imagine if in this next life I would, I would be born like a, as a rabbit. Imagine the misery. We are on the cutting edge of technology. Wow. Well, what does that mean? Let's plug it in. It's going to say, hey, I see you plugged in a new device and it's gonna load in the appropriate drivers. You'll notice that this scanner built, whoa. <laughs> well, all your technology stuff, it just ends in disaster. But there is one more thing. Okay, my hard drive just repaired itself. Uh, I was thinking of couscous, uh, which is uh, another thing used a lot in, uh, in the, um, uh, Arabic um, cuisine in Morocco as well. Uh, so couscous could also be a, a good pairing with the, the carrot salad. Um, technology, my best technology upgrades of the year. Next week, I'll give you my top five of favorite video games that I played in this section. But today, I want to talk about the, the biggest um, new pieces of technology that have changed my work or improved my life. In no particular order. What were my best tech upgrades? First of all, the Kindle Oasis. A Kindle with a physical page turner bot button. Um, John uh, gifted me his old Kindle Oasis. He got the new paper white with a, a nice uh, background color that changes from like bluish color to more orangey. Um, this this version of the Oasis only has one particular LED color. Um, but I don't often read in bed, so for me, it doesn't matter if it's just blue light. But I love that button. It was such a game changer. And I also really like the overall format of the of that Kindle. It has this, this very, um, uh, how do you call it? Like, um, not broad, white, with what? <laughs> I can't speak anymore. Oh my gosh. You can hold it on one side. There is this bezel and, and you can hold it in your hand in a very comfortable way. I love that. The physical form of the Kindle Oasis. Um, then uh, one downside of the Kindle Oasis, the first version is that uh, the battery uh, uh, um, is, is, is emptied very, very quickly, unfortunately. So um, you have to turn off all the Wi-Fi and all the extra stuff um, for it to have a normal battery lifespan. But um, yeah, I, I guess that that's one of the flaws of the Kindle Oasis. But but it, it really changed my reading habits. I love it. Um, the next thing uh, that is a minor game changer was uh, the little, little L-I-D-L, -L, so the German supermarket chain that is now all over the world. Uh, Little also sells light bulbs and and lots of other other technic tech tech technolo tech <laughs> technology. What's wrong with me? I've eaten too many carrots. It's impeding my speech. So um, you know I'm a huge fan of Philips Hue, and what I like about Philips Hue is that you can make these scenarios where you say I want my living room to feel like the Shire, and you can even upload a photo of the Shire, and it will change the colors of all these different uh, lights to mimic the colors in the photo. And it's, it's really, it's a, it works surprisingly well. Uh, you can uh, create lots of different moods thanks to all these different colors. The big downside of Philips Hue is these lights are insanely expensive. Like one, uh, one GU, GU10 LED light 
that you put in a spot uh, is about 30 bucks. It's, it's just, huh. I, I usually keep a good eye on um, when these things go on sale, usually around this time of the year, and then I buy them in bulk. But even then, they're still very pricey. Now, I was so surprised that Little sells alternative light bulbs that are compatible with the Zigbee protocol, which Philips Hue also uses. What I did not expect was the software that gives you the opportunity to create all these different atmospheres and scenes also works with those little bulbs. And they are super cheap. They're 10 bucks a piece. I got them for 50% off, five bucks per light. The only difference with the Philips Hue lights is that they're not as powerful. So they, there are fewer LEDs, but since they're just for mood and I only use them during nighttime, um, it doesn't really make much of a difference. I barely ever use my Hue light bulbs on 100% uh, strength anyway. So, um, but it's so incredible that these super dirt cheap lights work in conjunction with the, with the very expensive Hue lights and, um, and, and, and they're flawless. So um, Little has also some other uh, stuff um, like uh, they've got these um, internet switches um, that I still need to implement here in the house. Uh, they are also compatible with Philips Hue. So it's a huge budget tip for those of you that uh, would like to explore the capabilities of Hue. The only thing, the only caveat here is you need the, the Hue hub because without the hub, the Philips Hue hub, you cannot use the software. So Little has its own hub, but it's terrible and the software is terrible, but uh, you don't need that. You just get, get yourself a starter pack of Philips Hue and then just use the little um, uh, bulbs. Big other game changer, also thanks to, to John Domic, was his recommendation that I get a Sony WH-1000XM4 wireless headphone. He visited me uh, earlier this year and, and showed me those headphones. They have noise canceling, and I was sold immediately. It was so impressive. I use them every single day. What I love about these headphones is that I can... I can link them to two devices. So they're linked to my phone because of the audiobooks, um, but they're also linked to my television. And I used to have this big sound bar downstairs, which takes up a lot of space and is uh, you've got all the cable stuff. And I did that because the internal um, uh, speakers of, of the television are terrible. They're very thin and they don't sound good at all. Well, now I just use those wireless headphones and I use Bluetooth to connect to my television. I put on the headphones. They've got noise canceling. So even if there's noise outside, I don't even hear it. And it's such amazing sound. It's a very, very impressive. So glad I got those headphones. Um, and then the final two tech upgrades of the year that were life-changing <laughs> were, first of all, my iPad smart keyboard folio. So this is an external keyboard for uh, the iPad. And I have an iPad 12.6 inch. So the big one, or is it 12.9? I think it's 12.6. Anyway, got the big iPad. Um, I used to have the Logitech MX, uh, no, not the Logitech, what, the Logitech uh, whatever keyboard, um, which was great because it turns your iPad into basically a... Um, a laptop, but you can also use it as a tablet because you can wrap around the keyboard. The thing that I love the, the Logitech is a mechanical keyboard. It's very, very good backlight and everything, but it's heavy and it's bulky. And so I picked up this uh, very slim iPad alternative. doesn't have a touchpad, but who needs a touchpad? If you have a screen that is uh, touch sensitive, um, you can wrap around it. Uh, and it is amazing. It's, it is it has totally changed the way I use my iPad. My iPad right now is this the the one piece of a te technology that I use uh, 24 hours a day. <laughs> it's it's everything. I use it for reading, for 
um, as a remote control. I use it for my show. I right now, as you're listening to this, I have it in my hand. It's my notepad. Um, but then being able to switch very quickly between a super lightweight tablet mode and to use it almost as a perfect laptop replacement, I can carry it along with me wherever I go. It it it's got amazing battery power. Both, well, the keyboard itself is not battery powered. That's another advantage. Um, but the iPad itself, uh, the battery is amazing. Um, just awesome. Absolutely awesome. Best investment ever. Got it on sale though, because the original Apple price is very, very expensive. Um, I picked it up for 50 bucks, less than 50 bucks. So it's a very good deal. Um, and then the final Apple related upgrade was my MacBook Air. Uh, generation one with the M1 chip, blazingly fast and has replaced all my other computers. I used to uh, use my PC quite a bit for editing, playing video games. Nope, not necessary anymore. Uh, my MacBook Air can do everything. The only thing I wish it would have, and, and that, that may also be the only reason for me to maybe get another Mac, maybe the Mac Studio, uh, maybe in a second uh, iteration, is uh, it only has two USB ports, one of which is used for um, for the mains power. Uh, so you need a dongle, um, which I hate. And it doesn't have an SD uh, card. Uh, any, But those are the only two downsides of the MacBook Air, the Air the next, the current iteration of the MacBook Air does have one extra power um, plug. So you have two USB-C ports that are available. It's still not much. The reason I got this one over the MacBook Pro is that I tried them out in the store and the MacBook Air was really portable. The MacBook Pro for me was too heavy and too bulky. And I've used this thing in Rome. I've, I've taken it with me to the United States. I do not regret it. This was the perfect um, MacBook for me. I think I like the form factor even better than the new MacBook Air, uh, which is uh, a bit more inspired by the form factor of the MacBook Pros. It feels a bit bulky. It's lighter, technically, but it feels heavier. Those were my tech tips or my tech upgrades of the year 2022. It's time to wrap things up with the inspirational thought of the day. And of course, it's a Christmas thought. Um, it's part of a, a talk or maybe a homily by Pope Francis. You couldn't tell from the page on which I found it. But here's what Pope Francis says about Christmas. It will be Christmas if, like Joseph, we make room for silence. If, like Mary, we say, here I am to God. If, like Jesus, we are close to those who are alone. If, like the shepherds, we leave our enclosure to be with Jesus. Merry Christmas, everyone. We'll talk to you soon. God bless. And that's a wrap. All right. Hope you enjoyed that. Merry Christmas to all of you in the chat room. Ah, get these headphones off. Always feels a bit claustrophobic over time. All right. Would you believe me if I would tell you that this is actually, I'm using my internal camera here of the MacBook Air? Um, so it, it goes to show it's all about lighting. Um, I 
have a, an extra uh, light here. Um, and it already looks so much better than last week when I was using the same setup uh, to stream. Um, still would like to get myself uh, to get another um, uh, camera. There is a, a webcam with a that swivels. Um, uh, Cliff Ravenscraft talked about it. Um, or he has one actually, and and that image is super good. Um, this is a very low resolution 720p um, camera, unfortunately. Uh, the again, it's it's just it's another expense. I don't like to use to uh, buy stuff if I already have an alternative. So I like I like the the current result. It could be even better with a better camera, but. Uh, um, and uh, maybe I'll wait until I have my iPhone because the new iPhones also have the ability to be used as a replacement for the webcam. Um, you just mount it on top of the laptop. So maybe that's what I'm, that, that's probably what I will do because that, that is, yeah. Yeah, actually, why would I spend, what is it, 380 bucks on an external webcam that I didn't have to hook up via USB using a USB port. No, 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 no. I'm just going for the iPhone solution, I think. Hey, Jeremy, uh, Kenoya, Ken Kenwa. No, I wasn't thinking of Kenwa, but that's another good alternative, yes. Uh, thank you, Kathleen. I, I, I'm glad that that helped you a bit. Um... Growth and learning are spurred on by adversity. True, true. There's so many answers to this question, none of which are, are like specific answers to the to the problem. But it it's it's an alternative narrative. I think faith is all about reframing the way in which you look at the world instead of expecting faith to be a, like a magical solution to fix the world or to make it more like the world you would like to have. Um, In Sweden, there's always a Disney matinee. Oh, cool. Nice. <laughs> the snowman short. Yeah, that's that one's is lovely too. Christmas Carol from Charles Dickens. Huh. Okay, we've got another. Uh, uh, so I couldn't do um, I, I couldn't do moderation okay someone has already removed this one so normally I have moder moderators uh, active when I'm doing these live shows um, but I don't always announce when I go live The Holiday with Kate Winslet and Cameron Diaz. Oh, Last Holiday with Queen Latifah. Never heard of those. Christmas Vacation. Oh, yeah, that one is funny, too. Nightmare Before Christmas. It's a good one, too. National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. That is very funny. Very American, though. I'm not sure if it works because it's, a, yeah, it's so much part of the American culture. Um, Turbo Man. Peter, you liked Moonfall as your favorite movie? I thought, I mean, it was a popcorn movie, but man, that plot had more holes than, uh, than a Swiss cheese. <laughs> Family Man is definitely worth checking out. Very, very good movie. And, and very moving. I always cry when I watch it. I don't know why. Uh, I haven't seen Elvis yet. Is Elvis a Christmas movie then? Or just as a, a movie to watch? I saw it on, um, was it HBO Max? I think it's on HBO. The Batman. Yep. 
Spider-Man. Oh, I forgot about Spider-Man. Was that this year? Oh, I should have added that one. Yeah, Spider-Man. I thought it was last year. Okay, yeah, Spider-Man definitely should be in my top five at least. How could I forget about that one? Yeah, looking forward to watching uh, Pinocchio. Um, there are definitely some uh, a lot of Catholic elements in uh, in in this Pinocchio movie. Like the fairy is actually um, an angel, um, and it is um, a cherub cherubim, I think, with the, all the wings. It's fascinating. Avatar is a retelling of Dances with Wolves. Yeah, true. Way of the Water is underperforming. Yeah, it's doing well, but maybe not the blockbuster that they hoped it would be. Um, yeah, I'm using StreamYard. As you can tell, there's a logo here. Um, I, I, have, I have a very cheap subscription, which is no longer available. It's like 10 bucks a month. Um, the only downside is that it has this branding that I can't get rid of. But the alternative is going to, what is it, 40, 40 bucks per month, which is like, yeah, four times the price for just to get rid of this. And then it would allow me to stream in high definition. But it's just a stream, you know, it's not, it's not supposed to be documentary. So it's kind of uh, low, low resolution, but it's good enough, I think, for this. Um, all right. Well, that wraps it up for me. I'm going to uh, head towards the kitchen. The Polar Express. Yeah, that's not too bad. It's not too bad. No Way Home was December. Okay. Yeah, it was December of 2021. That's when it premiered. But I think I saw it this year. Um. Okay. Oh, Jeremy, thank you. That is, that's good to, that you let me know that the person that was going through such hardship, um, that her faith is actually uh, very strong now. Um, yeah. There's always another, there's always God... God doesn't cause evil or suffering, but he knows how to turn it around. Uh, my um, Peter says you can also use your uh, photo camera as a webcam. Um, I can, but not with this particular software. Um, and I think it's not the fault of StreamYard, but it is because of Chrome. Um, and iOS works, works really well on a PC, but this is not a PC that I'm using. All right. Talk to you all later. Have a wonderful rest of your day and, um, Merry Christmas.